My name is Christian Ashley, a seminary student and servant of God, and you are listening to the Let Nothing Move You podcast, a proud Anazal Ministries podcast. Welcome back to the Let Nothing Move You podcast. I'm your host, Christian Ashley, and I am feeling slightly better than the last couple of times I've had to record. <laughs> it's still been a hectic couple of weeks. Uh, just some days I'm feeling really great. And other days I'm just awful. Like I don't want to get out of bed or do anything. It is what it is. I'm just accepting it. The only thing I'm fairly certain it's not is that it's not COVID because I've been tested multiple times. <laughs> so that's where we are. Uh, thank you for everyone who's reached out to ask how I'm doing. I do appreciate that. Um, it is very helpful to hear uh, that you do, do all care about my well-being. Uh, I'm very great, grateful for that. So moving on to other news, uh, continuing as was released Saturday, uh, I will also be on the My Seminary Life podcast again with Brandon, where uh, the one that was released Saturday, like I said last time, was the review that he, Will, and I did of uh, Clash of the Titans, the 1981 film. Absolute blast there. Then Brandon and I later on did a show that should be releasing this Saturday on 300. And it is <laughs> it is a wild conversation about a wild movie. I had a ton of fun doing that with him. Uh, I'm very eager to uh, hear that when it releases uh, to just remember some of the things that we both said there that I've forgotten since we recorded it's going to be a fun time. So that's once again, that's my seminary life. Brandon and I, a member of the Anazal Ministries Podcasting Network. Uh, go check it out. Now, as for us, what will we be doing? Uh, we'll be going today into the book of Romans and to chapters eight and nine. I thought about splitting these up like I had in the past, but I mean, really, I kind of want to keep this going. I've enjoyed having multiple chapters in some of these. I, if there's really a chapter I want to focus on exclusively, like, I'll definitely do that. Like, my plan is to just keep going two by two until we get to the end of Romans. If that changes, I'll let you know, or I hope I'll let you know. <laughs> Some of these decisions are made spur of the moment, which is very anti-me, but that's just how it is. All right, starting in Romans, in uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has, sent, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who will live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. All this to say, the free gift that can that only is select few choose to take is salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because of this gift, those of us who said yes to him are now no longer under the righteous judgment of God. The law of the Spirit destroys the laws of sin and death, making us appear before him as spotless and sinless. This is the essential truth of the gospel that Jesus came to us in our weakness and inability to save ourselves and offered a way out of it. Those who remain in their flesh cannot ever appease God or become one with him. Also looking in here, we see there needed to be a replacement for our sins. And the way the old sacrificial system worked 
It was an animal. Jesus then became the ultimate sacrifice on the cross, taking it away from us. Not a single one of us could have ever become that replacement or do anything worthy of becoming that replacement because our sins marred our souls from the moment we committed our first. We were set apart from God. Thus, the only way for God to reconcile his chosen to come back to fellowship with him was to send himself in the form of Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, so he would die for our benefit, taking on the totality of every sin ever committed to make us clean. He then cast off that sin into the abyss where it belongs, resurrected, and gives us a new life. Our, our physical bodies are dead, thanks to the corruption of sin in the world. But our souls still have the chance to repent and become his. This change is something that is completely supernatural and sends us on a whole new course far beyond where our sinful bodies would ever be able to. If you have said yes to Jesus, then you are finally alive. Verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our sin that we are children of God. Uh, excuse me. That, that <laughs> I don't know if I said the wrong thing there. Let me, let me, let me get back to that, that verse. Uh, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit <laughs> that we are children of God. <laughs> Even in Joshua, I don't care. Let people know how much of a screw up I am. That's funny. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I, yeah. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. If there's nothing wrong with what I said, if I thought I replaced the word spirit with sin. If I didn't, that's just me being brain addled from medication. And if if I did... <laughs> That's just funny. Uh, you got to laugh at yourself. You got to realize hey, you're a screw up. You're going to mess up. You're going to read things wrong. And then you got to laugh at yourself. That it obviously wasn't a point of what I was trying to say earlier, but that's something you, we can all learn from there. It's like, look, we're inhuman. We're perfect. Our voices are going to mess up. We're going to read things wrong. Like, just own up to it. Like, I could have easily just said, hey, Joshua, take that out. And like, you could argue I'd be right to do so. But at the end of the day, like, look, I'm just an idiot. I'm just a guy who God saved from himself. I'm imperfect. Let's be imperfect together, working towards perfection. So to actually focus on the verses in question, <laughs> we see that we are debtors to our own sin if we do not know God. And that is simply a debt we can never repay as we have a creditor in sin who always extends the loan and the price we have to pay so that we can never pay it. Much in the same way, there are humans out there who treat their fellow human beings when it comes to lending money or influence just so they can charge whatever they want to keep someone in debt and to reap the benefits. For a Christian to act in this manner is unlawful and evil. There is nothing inherently wrong with lending out money and charging interest. There is something inherently evil with doing so in a manner where the lender knows they keep the person they lent the money to under their thrall. We are no longer slaves to sin and should not act in this manner as we are showing that we do not live by the Spirit if we do these things. Now, this may seem like an odd aside to bring in when Paul's primary point, well, remember we want to focus on the primary points first, which is why I brought that up earlier, his primary point is to speak of the spiritual side of things, but there is a correlation in that if we act in this sinful manner, we are showing a lack of appreciation for the immense debt that we no longer have to pay for being taken from us by afflicting another with uncontrollable debt. It's, it's simply ridiculous to think that we can act in a Christ-like manner doing something like that, holding it over someone when God no longer holds our own sin over us, our own debt against him that we owe him, that we can never give him on our own merit. And we do that to someone else, whether it be money 
or I'm using my prestige over you and you have to work with me so that we can get things done. Like, it doesn't matter. The point is we're acting in a sinful manner thinking we're being righteous. And the world's, that's not good. And the world deserves better from us in that regard. I mean, essentially, also, we, we did not accept a new master when it comes to God just to be enslaved by him like we were to sin. God is the perfect master who cannot ever treat his followers with evil. We do not need to fear his intent and purpose for us as we did while we were slaves to sin. We lived eternally, uh, excuse me, <laughs> it felt like eternity to us. We felt lived in that fear while we were under the grasp of sin because it's a master we could never please. You ever have that boss that no matter what you do, that it's like you've done nothing? Or a person or someone who tried, you thought would be your friend and the exact same thing happened? That's awful. It's like, why is my best not good enough? Well, in the world's view, it's never going to be good enough. And it's not good enough for God either. But he covers that. And then he doesn't hold, us, hold it against us. We have been wondrously adopted into the family of God and received the birthrights that are due to natural born children as if we had always been such like that's how it was supposed to have been adam and eve in perfection in the garden living with god having children and they would have done the exact same as time went on and on and on being gifted with all the freedom that comes from loving god but now we have the chance to go back to that by being adopted into that family we should have been in the first place Next up, verses 18 through 30. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined. He also called and those whom he called. He also justified and th those who he, whom he justified. He also glorified. Let's start right back at the beginning of these verses. We will continue to experience suffering in this life, even after being made sons and daughters of God. I've said it before. And I'll say it again. If there is someone you are aware of in this world that preaches that suffering should no longer happen to the Christian while we inhabit this world, run away as far as possible from them. For they speak heresy and they probably want your money. It's not smart to ever think that. It is not logical to think that, oh, the moment I accept Jesus, it's going to be sunshine and rainbows from here. I can be singing Kumbaya in a circle, just singing about how much we love God. We're going to get along with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we'll get along with the world, too. It's like, no, that's what we should be doing. But life gets in the way. Sin gets in the way. The world gets in the way. We get in the way of ourselves. Suffering continues to exist even after conversion because we still live in a broken world and suffering will only truly cease when we either die or end up raptured in the midst of the tribulation whenever the heck that happens. I'm not here to say that right now. We'll get the revelation from ever for now. Hopefully by then I'll have a better point of view than I have right now, even though I do stick by what I think. 
accept this fact or end up falling prey to those who want to twist the truth to their purposes. You know, it is perfect, perfectly natural to want to escape from suffering. I hate pain. I don't want to suffer. It's not fun it, it, <laughs> because it's suffering. No one wants to feel that way. And if you do, get help. It's not good. So we do everything in our power to avoid it. Like, no one wants, we, we want to escape from that suffering, especially in light of the fact that we know what we were truly meant for in perfect and wondrous worship with God for eternity. When we look at scripture, we see, oh, that's what I'm destined for. Why can't I have that now? Take me away from this world. Just, just take me out like Enoch or Elijah. Like, I, I want to be gone and with you forever. Like, that makes perfect sense because we, we seek after God and we desire him. But that's not our place. At this point in time, you know, said it before, no one wishes to suffer. And those that are his all desire to be with him and to get away from a world that despises us. The folly comes in, however, when we say that we don't deserve to suffer anymore because we're special and we're set apart and we're better than those other fools who don't know who Jesus is. Look, look, we are special and set apart, but we're still humans. And we cannot escape the evils of this world until we are called to go back to him on his time, not Christian's time, not your time, not anyone else's time, on his time. Look, that may seem depressing, but that's only if we ignore the fact that he is still there watching over us and loving us in the midst of whatever oppresses us, always loving his children he brings comfort in times of stress and distress and evil. He's still there. He may not look like it. We may be so swamped by things and lost in our own thoughts and uh, depression and sin and what have you that we don't see him. But he's still there and he still loves us. We have to look for him a little harder sometimes than we want to. Also, we see here there have been many times in our lives where we have been brought to the point of prayer and we haven't known what to say in the midst of our anguish. Has anyone ever had that prayer? It's like, everything's going wrong, and I don't know how to put the thoughts in my head into words to describe how I'm feeling and what I want done. But that's okay, because eventually the words came. And that's because the Holy Spirit is there for us, and we'll offer the right words to say, and even better, he is interceding on our behalf for our benefit. That is the glorious part of having the Spirit live within us. He's always there. He knows what's happening. And he can bring us those words to, to take up to God in prayer, interceding for us so that we may be well. Let's look at verse 28 real quick. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. This is one of the most commonly misquoted verses of Scripture. It does not promise to remove affliction and evil from our lives. What it does promise is that no matter what happens, God will work everything that did happen, good and evil, for our good, which means our growing and understanding of God will increase and strengthen us even in the midst of despair. There have been so many times in my life when I've been brought low, and it's like, why are you there? You're not even doing anything. It's like, aren't, aren't things supposed to be working out for my good? Yes, they are, even in the midst of suffering. We don't like it. We don't have to like it. We shouldn't like some of it. But bringing us to that point of suffering sometimes is there to teach us. Even if we don't know where, what the purpose is in that moment. It could be years from now down the road. It could be decades. But there is a point to it. It doesn't seem like it in the moment, but there is. And it will strengthen our faith. It will show us who he really is, that he brought us out of that for our good so that we can also enrich the lives of others. After this, we get to that good old conversation of predestination versus free will. Now, this is bare bones definitions like predestination states that God selected all who would be his from the beginning of time while free will states that we all have the equal chance of saying yes to him and God mostly keeps out of it. 
Now, those are very simplified versions. I'm sure if you have something you would rather have said to me, please reach out to me. The nothing movie podcast at gmail.com. I'm willing to listen. Uh, as for me, all cards on the table. I think it's both because I just have to be that way. I just have to make my own. And I know other people have had it before me. Obviously, I'm not that special. I believe God knew who would be his because he himself exists outside of time and therefore had the knowledge of who would say yes to him, while also devising matters for them to reach that point in their lives as he chose for them to do. Some people are really extreme in their interpretations, and guess what? These verses are open to interpretation. I favor mine, but I will readily admit that it is not flawless. I cannot tell you like, yep, Every bit of scripture is pointing to my interpretation of that. And there is nothing of me coming in there that's coloring my view of it. If I'm being objective, I can't say that. There are things I like about predestination. There are things I like about free will. So I combine the two and say it's both. But you'll have your ultra predestination people who say, I have no choice in the matter. I'm a puppet. Uh, It's not what they'll say, but it's kind of where I think in that regard. And, you know, God chose me from the beginning of time and made me his. And you had the free wills who was like, oh, well, it'll just happen eventually. Like people just got to get there. And all this mess is it's a little too, too, too free spirited for my taste. What do you guys think? I would like to know. Like, obviously, I take my point of view and I'm holding to it. But you know, like I said earlier, it's, it's open to interpretation. Look, the only reason way we're ever going to know how it actually works is when we're in eternity with him. I mean, that's kind of one of those things we have to make peace with as time goes on. We can argue all day long. It's predestination. It's free will. It's both. It's some other fourth option. It, we don't know because we're limited by our human mortal understanding. Regardless, we can take comfort in the fact that God knows us and desires us to be with him. Not only that, but he takes time to justify us and then makes us glorified in his presence. That's some more good news. I'll never get people who look at what Paul has to write and say, man, he's just so depressing all the time. Sure. There are things in there that are like cut you to the quick and make you think and stumble for a bit, but there's so much positivity in this man's writing bringing us back to who Christ is and why he does what he does, why God does what he does, why the spirit does what he does. And it's for this, so that we can be glorified in his presence and live in eternity with him. Next up, to finish off this part of the chapter, uh, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Positivity, people. There it is right there. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Well, the answer is plenty. There's plenty of people out there, but that's good news also. They're always doomed to failure. They cannot fight against the almighty God who can never be beaten or thwarted. The plans and schemes of men and women who deny him can never prosper ultimately. At best, they may gain temporary reprieve from the consequences of their own sin and cause suffering in the world but their ultimate faith has been assured by their actions and inability to repent. There are plenty of people out there working against us. There are plenty of people, whether it be 
unbelievers around you, whether that be fellow Christians that aren't living out their lives the way they should be, or pe- people who think they are Christian. There are plenty of people willing to work against you. There are bad bosses. There are bad co-workers. There are bad members of a church. There are warlords out there enslaving children to fight for them. There are sexual traffickers out there leading women and men into terrible lives of depravity that they can't escape from. There are plenty of people working against us, but they're not going to win. And that's easy to say, but it's true. They're not going to win. They can never win, especially when we look in sight uh, in the view of God who didn't even spare Jesus, a part of himself in the Trinity, from harm. So why would anyone think they could overcome him? Like, God used himself to die. And these fools think they can overtake him? Well, it's because of pride, mostly. Foolishness created by pride. The smartest and craftiest among them deny reality for their own supposed benefit, leveling charges against God and his chosen few but they're all going to fall and fail in the end because they are not God and never will be. Nothing in this world can take us away from him, not even ourselves if we've also already said yes to him. Nor can Satan and his demonic minions overpower the all-consuming love and forgiveness offered by God. They too are doomed to failure. Read Revelation. It's a wonderful story. The end of all things is coming, and it's for our benefit to create something new. God is willing and able to protect us from from that which thinks it can overcome him, and he will always be proven right in the end. All you have to do is read this this entire book every single time. Even in the midst of suffering, God comes out on top. God's people come out on top. Through persecution, through exile, through death and destruction, God's people come out on top in the end. It doesn't always feel like it when you're reading these stories, but we know where they end up. And that's eternity with him. Next up, Romans 9, verses 1 through 13. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all who are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But... Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, Not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Paul, at the very beginning of this chapter, shows the truth of God's changing this man's heart by talking about how he would give it all up and lose his salvation if it meant others came to faith. This is a bold statement and one that should charge us forward in the battle against the the, system. this entire world and its lies and evil. We who are his truly know what we have been given in salvation and freedom. And we should celebrate that. There should be a stirring and a fire growing in our hearts to see the lost and know that we have to do everything we can to bring them into the fold so that they may feel that same zeal and commitment to the cause and go and make disciples themselves. Paul uses this argument, not because it is possible for him to lose his salvation, but to show the anguish in his heart for those who do not know the truth. It would be better in his own mind for countless people to come to faith and he to be condemned to eternal hellfire so that they may know the truth. But this is impossible. Paul is saved and cannot lose it. But what it does show is his heart for ministry and love for the lost. Have you ever felt that way in your walk? I'm not saying you have to, but I've been there. Like, God, wouldn't it be better 
couldn't I just give this up for them? Not out of some martyr's complex or, oh, what people would be praising my name. He willingly gave up his salvation so that 75 people would come to faith or however many. It's like, no, but because out of that anguish in our hearts for the lost to say, I would give this all up for them so that they could know the truth. So they can know how I feel, even if it meant losing it all, just for them. Once again, I'm not saying you have to feel that way, but I am saying there is something that shows a tremendous amount of change in someone's heart if you have that feeling. And I'm not going to pretend like I have it every day. Look, I love what I have. Like, I love the salvation. I love what comes with the promise of what is to come. And that is why sometimes I do feel that way. I, I give it up if it meant just two people came to faith and I lost it all. Just something for you to think about. Once again, I'm not saying you have to think that way. Let's go over to the genealogical history of the Jewish people here Paul brings up. There are still many Jews today who deny Christ's divinity. Even still, they are still his first chosen people and he still watches over them and protects them. All it takes is a very careful studying of their own history to see his endless love for them. No other nation in the world has have ever had its homeland restored to them after almost 2,000 years of living in diaspora. Nor has any nation faced so many enemies around their boundaries and managed to come out relatively unscathed in three separate wars where they alone were truly defending themselves. They had help. They had people giving them weapons and stuff like that. They're also surrounded in a nation about the size of New Jersey against nations way bigger than that. And yet somehow they come out on top. Hmm, it seems weird. God continues to keep the promise he made with the patriarchs and rulers of Israel, even when they deny him. This is what unfailing love is capable of, even when we deny it as well. God is doing that for people who don't believe in him. Can you imagine what he will do for people that do? He still wants reconciliation between him and them. It's a beautiful story. Like, seriously, check out the history of the, of the diaspora, of the Jewish people, of God loving them, of God loving us. It's a beautiful story. If you look at everything within the context of his love and history, so, on, so much more. Now we get to the segment here. Uh, I don't expect everyone who's listening to this to have read the Old Testament and understand it. I'll do my best here. So uh, God promises Abraham, out of all the people in the world, I'm going to make a mighty nation out of you. Abraham lives to be over 100, excuse me, uh, to be 100, and his wife, Sarah, they don't have kids. God still promises them that God gives him a son named Isaac. Isaac then marries Rebecca, who likewise has issues with conceiving a child like Sarah did. God gives them both Jacob and Esau. Now, Esau is the older brother of the twins, and by every right, he should have been the one who got his father's possessions. God, however, chooses Jacob. So with that in mind, the verse that Paul is referring to here outside of the Genesis stuff is in Malachi, where the Israelites are asking, what have you ever done for us? Which is a bold statement to make in the last book of the Old Testament. It's like, uh, clearly someone hasn't been paying attention. He points out to the Israelites that he favored them and Jacob over Esau, who rightfully, once again, by the standards of the world, deserved favor as the older son of Isaac. However, God rejected Esau even before Esau had ever done anything wrong because he knew that Esau's heart was not set on him. And that is where the hatred comes from. Now, we'll get to that hatred in a second. Look, Jacob wasn't perfect either. I mean, all you have to do is once again, read through Genesis to see how that's going. But he still chose Jacob to be the one that he's going to make this mighty nation out of. And in the end, Jacob did ultimately seek out after God more than Esau has ever shown doing. It may seem especially harsh for God to feel hatred towards Esau. But if you've been following along with anything I've been saying, then you know God cannot abide in the presence of sin. And Esau made no such gestures to seek reconciliation as Jacob would. Thus God, being true to himself, despised Esau for his sin and pride, even before Esau had done these things, because once again, God is outside of time, so he knows what Esau is going to do. Yet even in that, 
he still allowed Esau to prosper. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Uh, you've got to read. Uh, we have a list of Esau's descendants in Genesis. It's a wonderful thing. God still blesses him, even after rejecting him, even in the midst of hating Esau's sin, not because of Esau's works, but because of God's purpose and what he was doing. Esau is eventually able to have enough descendants to create the entire nation of Edom, who would be a thorn in Israel's side for many years as a nation. But God still blessed someone who didn't deserve it, by the way. Remember that. What these verses tell us is that God will not simply let in the Jewish people because he chose them in Abraham, in Isaac, in Jacob. They have to make the same choice Jacob did to follow him. Otherwise, they, like Esau, are destined for destruction. So it is true of us that we are like Jacob and that the firstborn in Israel did not get salvation simply because they were first. But we, Jew and Gentile alike, did get salvation because we sought God out and said yes to him. These verses have often been used by fools to continue some of the earlier discussions I've mentioned that they use about their point of view to justify hatred of the Jewish people. Which, excuse me, which simply shows these fools had the reading comprehension level of those who think that the Joker and Harley Quinn are in a loving and stable relationship, or they say how cool it would be to participate in the Hunger Games, or they actually think that Satan is the person we're supposed to support while reading Paradise Lost. It's maddening. If for some reason there is someone out there who thinks this way and is listening to this right now, please flee from this folly. You have misinterpreted what God is saying here because he loves Jacob. And rejected Esau. And even Israel right now, to an extent, those who don't know God are a modern day Esau. But he still seeks reconciliation with them. He still wanted Esau to be his. But Esau wouldn't. So we can never justify that racial hatred there. It has no place in the gospel. And I know that Christian, you keep bringing this, this up. Like, I'm in church. No one around me does it. Well, that's great. I, I'm really happy about that. I don't want to be around people that do that. But all you have to do is look out into the world to see people saying stupid things like this and thinking they're right. How many iterations have we had of the Ku Klux Klan when it comes to a hatred against African-Americans, hatred against the Jewish people, for foreigners in general, compared to you know white people? It happens over and over again. And people in the church support it. This evil cannot be allowed to prosper. And it's not like America is the only place where this ever happens. Once again, all you have to do is look at the world. It happens all over the place. There are plenty of xenophobic nations out there. I'm not saying America is xenophobic. I'm saying there are people within America that are xenophobic, and there are people in those nations that I mentioned that were xenophobic that are not xenophobic themselves. But people will twist verses like these for their own purposes to make themselves look righteous by saying, oh, well, we're not like faithless Israel who doesn't believe in God, therefore they deserve to die. But who made you that arbiter? It certainly wasn't God. All it takes is some basic reading comprehension here, people. And sadly, that's not as widespread as it should be. And the church has failed immensely in that regard in some of these areas. Not, not saying the whole church. There are plenty of people out there who've got it right. But we've got to focus on these negative things in order to realize they exist and they need to be destroyed. Verses 14 through 18. I've ranted long enough. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. And we'll get to Pharaoh in a second. God is never unjust when it comes to his judgments. He alone is true because he is the one who created truth. He offers mercy to those he wishes to give mercy and compassion to those he wishes to give compassion. You know why? Because he can. Because he's the one who made everything. He gets to make that call. We take offense to this 
because it means we don't get to make the same ultimate decisions he does because we want to be like him, which, by the way, has been our struggle ever since the Garden of Eden. And we still haven't learned our lesson. And I say our because I feel the same way sometimes. I want to be God. OK, anyone say that? You want to say that out loud for yourselves? Say, I want to be God. You know why? Because it's true. That has been our struggle since the beginning. It will be our struggle until the end of days and the new heaven and the new earth come. And we need to say those things out loud because we need to be honest with ourselves. We want to be God. We want to make the ultimate decisions. We want to be in charge. This thought process is sinful and evil, and we need to cut it out, remove it completely from our lives. And once again, I say we because I'm right there with you. I struggle every day wanting to be him. I don't say that. I don't, I don't uh, word it that way. And that's what I'm saying, really, ultimately. Next up, God raises up people to display his glory, whether they be faithful followers or prideful fools, that he will bring lowly like Pharaoh. Salvation is not wholly dependent on human actions. God uses humans to teach us more about himself and what we are not supposed to be like. If God chooses to organize events to display his power and mercy, then who are we to say otherwise? We are nothing without him. We do not exist without him saying, let there be light. Let there be man made in our image. Those don't happen without him. We need to recognize that fact and go, oh, oh, I'm beneath him. Yeah, that's great. This doesn't mean that we never wonder the reasons for God's decisions. We never go, oh, what was his purpose of doing that? Like, uh, how could he choose Jacob over Esau? Like, those are logical questions to ask. Never hear me say, don't ask those questions. But what it does mean is that we need to shape up and listen to him when he says to do something or watch what he is doing. When God says, watch, I'm going to do a mighty work. My, the question is not, uh, okay, but why? My question is, okay, how can I do it, Lord? Verses 19 through 29. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved for the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Israel, excuse me, Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. These verses here make many people uncomfortable. And I, I include myself in that manner because once again, I talk earlier of my thoughts of predestination free will. Some of these are hard to wrestle with in my point of view. And these verses should make us feel uncomfortable. They show that some are destined for destruction and others for life. This is not God shaping someone for a purpose because he always wanted them to fail or he always wanted them to succeed because God knows who we are and planned for that in order that we, he might be glorified. We go back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh was evil to rule cruelly over the Israelites and to watch his people suffer from the plagues. He had plenty of opportunities to beg for forgiveness and to let the people of God go. We see in the book of Exodus that Pharaoh hardened his heart multiple times against God's message. Multiple times we see Pharaoh harden his heart. Pharaoh harden his heart. Pharaoh harden his heart. Before we get a verse where we're told God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You know what that tells me? It tells me God didn't override Pharaoh's free will. He merely confirmed what Pharaoh was already committed to. In that same way, we all have plenty of opportunities to say yes or no to God. 
we do not get to question our ultimate purpose in his designs when we have done nothing to change ourselves and seek after him. Oh, why is this happening to me? Well, what have you done to change? What have you done to have your heart set on him? Is your heart set on him? Was it ever? I'm not saying this to make you question your salvation or you know, say, oh, look at me. I'm better than you. It's like, no, I've had those thoughts too. You've got to ask those questions within light of who we know God is. God has created a world that he righteously, as I've said many times before, he should have destroyed the moment sin entered it. Yet instead, because God is unfair and we should all be saying hallelujah, he offered numerous opportunities for both his wrath and his mercy to be displayed. God has been incredibly patient with all of us, and we do not get the right to say that he hasn't. This is a foolish statement because it shows that we haven't been paying attention. These are just some examples. There are plenty more out of all scripture and even beyond scripture. He could have righteously judged the entire human race to be destroyed by the flood for their sins, but he kept a remnant and Noah and his sons and their wives alive. Or even after saving the Jews from Egypt, he could have wiped them out every single time they groaned and complained, which we would have done the exact same thing. Don't let anyone ever tell you differently. It's like, oh, I would have been better. Like, no, you wouldn't have. I would have been worse. I'm a complainer. Like, uh, if God would have righteously struck me down a couple of times in the Exodus, uh, in, in the midst of walking the desert for 40 some years. Uh, knowing me, I would have added another 40 to it. Yet he kept a remnant alive. Yet even the complainer Christian he keeps alive today because he's merciful to the idiot complainer Christian. He's merciful to you as well. The same is true of us and the church. He could have wiped out the churches that the letters were sent to in Revelation in the very beginning of the book who had allowed heresies and evil to live within them but instead, he offered mercy by calling them to repent, except for the one church under persecution, which he praised for their faithfulness. Even outside of the, the Bible, it only takes a novice in history to, to realize that God could have righteously destroyed the church for failing to follow him with their full hearts. Once again, these are only some examples. There are plenty more. And now I'm going to bring up the Crusades, because I think people just say that, and they don't know if the Crusades actually were. Granted, they're right to say it. They just don't understand why. And if someone ever brings that up, by the way, ask them, oh, which crusade? And they're going to go, uh, because they don't know. There's been over 10 crusades. And that's just in the Middle East. There are plenty more. All of them, I would say, not righteous. But it shows a lack of understanding. People that just bring it up. That's their ultimate point. It's like they don't even understand what they're saying. So ignoring the crusades, which is still a, a point against the church, we have indulgences, we have racial strife, we have wars of conquest. So that, oh, we just have to go to those nations and let them know about who Jesus is, and it's okay. And many people we die and send to hell along the way. Well, that are just casualties of war. And then plenty more beyond that have all been done in unrighteousness by the church, and all would have been more than enough reason for God to destroy us, whether it was the Protestant church, the Catholic church, the Nestorian church. Orthodox Church, Coptic, or whatever denomination that exists that claims Christ, he would have been righteous to wipe us all out and start anew. God does not owe us anything, yet offered a free gift anyways, knowing we would screw up and fail even after receiving it. Anyone who says God does not love those destined for destruction does not understand him because we are all destined for destruction without his intervention which we all experience that intervention yet only a few commit to it i don't like that I'm, cards on the table again i don't like that i want everyone to come to him but i don't have to like it i have to accept reality and work to bring others to him verses 30 through 33 and we'll be done for the day christ is a stumbling block to those who think because of their racial origins their adherence i'll go <laughs> Oh, there I go, screwing up again. Joshua, keep this in. I skipped to my notes and not the verses. 30 through 33. You see, this is a wonderful story of forgiveness here. Thank you for your patience. 
<laughs> Verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it. That, that is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. People, you got to laugh at yourself. I'm so stupid sometimes. I know better. And I looked at the wrong thing. Laugh with me, please. Just laugh with me. And then look at this. As uh, some idiot was saying earlier, Christ is a stumbling block. To those that think because of their racial origins, their adherence to the law, their noble birth, their money and fame, or what have you, that they deserve him and they deserve to be saved. This is not true. It has never been true. Just as much as being raised in a church doesn't guarantee salvation, so it is the same for the Jewish people who think it is their birthright. We are just as guilty as them when we think this way. Both are wrong. Christ coming into the world upended this idea, especially to the Jewish people then, because his sacrifice was for everyone and him dying meant that there had never been a guarantee for anyone of being saved simply because of who they were. But to those of us who have accepted him, there is no shame. We are his forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. We're done with Romans 8 and 9. Thank you, everyone, for being patient. <laughs> As I screwed up several times in this recording, I could easily go back and record this all again. But uh, once again, I, I like the transparency. Like, I'm just a big screw up, too. I'm working on it. And this is useful for me to know how to be humble, how to be better than myself. Because like that instinct of that, I can't show weakness. I can't show anyone that I ever made a mistake. And that's that's patently false. You have to show you're capable, you're fallible of just making bad decisions or uh, letting your mind wander to the wrong place or twisting up words and reading the wrong lines or looking at your notes instead of the scripture and thinking you're reading the other. <laughs> it all happens. So thank you again for listening. Please, if you have the chance, just leave a five-star review just to help uh, the ratings there to get more people access to the show. If you're interested in my fiction writing, you can find my works at starvingwritersguild.com or on Amazon by searching for the name MC Ashley. If you're all interested in some further solid studies into the Bible and its teachings, then check out the other members of the Anazal Ministries Podcasting Network. Contact me at letnothingmoveypodcast at gmail.com. I'd like to extend a uh, special thank you to Joshua Knoll for the editing that he does and for the music that he adds to the podcast. And with all that in mind, God bless you all in accordance to his will and not mine. And allow me one more time to remind you, let nothing move you.